British business in the formative years of European integration and reluctant Europeans, the Federation of British Industry and European Integration, 1945 to 63. He's also an editor of British Business. And our two discussants are Stephen Altman Richer, who heads the CBI's uh, campaign team ahead of the European referendum. Until August, he led the CBI's flagship project, which was, is, to secure a global future for Britain in a reformed Europe. It's not always proving a terribly straightforward task, um, with claims this morning at the CBI conference, I think there was a banner saying CBI, the voice of Brussels, and there have been claims uh, that the CBI has jumped the gun, uh, and even that its, its claims about the majority of British businesses wanting to stay uh, in Europe was based on dodgy polling. But I dare say Stephen will be able to put us right on uh, some of these uh, amazing claims some of which, of course, might just possibly come from the out campaign. And we also have with us Alex Storey. Alex is campaign director for uh, Business for Britain, which supports the Vote Leave campaign, although it also says that some of its supporters, quite legitimately, are waiting to see what reforms David Cameron comes up with before they make up their minds. And Business for Britain also says that its agenda is to see fundamental changes to our relationship with the European Union. And I think we're going to start with Glenn, if you would speak first. Thank you. Thank you, Sue, and thank you to the organisers of this conference for inviting me. It's very nice to speak here. And uh, the first thing to say is uh, that our Associate Dean for Research at Oxford Brooks insists that I say that you can follow me on Twitter or you can read my blog in order to boost my engagement factor with the public and with uh, business and industry. So you can, if you so wish, read about history and data on the blog or you can read about history and data and business on, on the Twitter feed uh, if you like to read rhetoric, rhetoric about these things, entertaining or not. Um, I think I wanted to take a broad view of the 1950s to the 1970s in this very short uh, discussion and look at why British industry's attitude to the European community, European economic community, changed really quite rapidly between those two decades. Because to begin with in the 1950s, British industry, at least in its organised and discussion, discussion uh, format, was uh, very ambivalent about uh, the European project, as it were. And also it was the subject of a cacophony of voices where industry business spoke in very different ways depending on whether you were a producer or whether you were a consumer, whether you represented a very high-value industry or very low-value-added industry, etc., etc. And although there are a series of bilateral and informal organisations that linked British business to French and German industry, for instance, led by Sir Hugh Beaver, who at the time was uh, MD of Guinness. It was the case, I think, that British industry overall was rather sceptical about very deep or very rapid uh, European integration, partly because it had lived behind uh, a very deep tariff wall and a very deep subsidy wall and a very deep array, a wall of non-tariff barriers to trade, such as production arrangements since 1931, since the early 1930s, and partly because I think in the early 1950s, British business was, as it perceived itself, just escaping from the, the kind of yoke of the Labour government, just escaping from the yoke of production agreements, of very, very high levels of taxation, and of the threat of nationalisation of the top 500 or 1,000, even retail companies, as, as business perceived it. And therefore, there wasn't the push from business to take part in uh, the uh, European cold steel community, for instance. However, by 1975, and Rob's already taken us through this uh, more than satisfactorily and better than I can, including using this same image, so this is uh, how great minds think alike or, or fools seldom differ, depending on your point of view. Um, by the 1975 referendum, business is extremely pro-European. Almost all the chairmen of major listed companies are pro-European. The CBI is extremely pro-European. The CBI has its own operations room, pumping out a stream of pro-European propaganda. Mr. Europe's are appointed in 800 companies across private industry to proselytise in the workplace for the European ideal, 
And, of course, as Rob also pointed out, the, the in-campaign is extremely, extremely well funded to the tune of what today would be tens of millions of pounds from big business and from, from the banking sector. So I wanted to try very quickly in the, in the next kind of 10 minutes to explain why this might be, explain why this transformation occurred. And I think we have to start with a sense of inevitability that gained a hold after the perceived failure of the EFTA negotiations in the late 1950s. Because even the FBI, the old Federation of British Industries, came to think that the European ideal might have something to it in that there would be nowhere else to go by 1958-59. However, it was held back by its structure, by its members, and by the views of other, perhaps, uh, brother and sister organisations. For instance, the British Employers' Confederation, which had come to take an extremely gloomy and almost apocalyptic view of the prospects for the British, for the British economy, based on its so-called deep-seated labour market problems, its deep-seated problems with trade unions, its deep-seated problems with the lack of the rule of law, as the BEC perceived it, and the National Union of Manufacturers, which spoke for smaller manufacturers, which also was very, very sceptical because it did not believe that for these kind of intermediate companies that the European market was an appropriate market because it was so big and they might drown in it, of course. What really changed this, I think, in British industry was the creation of the CPI itself as an umbrella group bringing these, uh, these views together and bringing these views together under the banner of what might, one might call technocracy. John Davis, its first, uh, his first director, was really the first of what later become known as the Heathmen, what later become known as the, the big corporatizers of British government, of British private governance as well. He'd been an accountant, been chief accountant in BP. His career actually looks rather like uh, Vince Cable's career in many, in many ways and probably has similar reasons why they've come to such similar pro-European views. And essentially what the technocrats, the corporatizers, the Heathmen argued was that British industry was too small and British industry needed to be bigger and British industry needed to be subject to a big shakeout by exposure to massive scale markets. Davies later becomes... Uh, head of the DTI and, and a minister under Heath and a Conservative MP. And if I could draw your attention inside, inside Whitehall, that's exactly the same view that's gaining hold at the same time as the CPI is created in 1965 and therefore submerges these smaller and more interested in labour markets kind of uh, organisations, submerges the BEC, submerges the NUM into a great big corporatising voice. That's the same view that's taking hold in, in Whitehall. Our, it's, this is by Crispin Tuchel, and it's 1964, later a UN ambassador of, uh, and UN diplomat, of course, arguing essentially that it's the bigness of the European market that's going to be vastly important, whatever Britain does. So therefore, Britain might as well have a voice at the table and might as well have a vote. I'll come back to this idea of the Europe as the future in the next few slides. Because what's in the background is the idea and represented in all sorts of what you might call imaginative figuring, all sorts of charts and tables and, and pie charts and, and, and bar charts like this, that Britain's economy is growing very, very slowly. This is just 1960s GDP, gross domestic product per capita growth, and dear old Blighty is right down the bottom behind even the economic powerhouses of kind of Romania, Bulgaria, uh, and the Soviet Union. And essentially... One of the arguments about why this was the case is that the British economy is too small and its markets that it can uh, rely on if it stays out of the EEC, the declining empire commonwealth, will also be too small. Now, so that's the kind of imaginative intellectual background. Now, as we know, of course, that's not necessarily really the whole picture. That's imagination rather than reality. And we've heard already today about the way in which uh, the European uh, view, views of the European Union are conceptualised rather than necessarily how they actually are, inverted commas. Because what's happening is that those other powers are catching up on the British leader. Britain's are much, much richer than anybody else in Europe in 1950. And even after the 30 glorious years in France, French people are only slightly richer than British people because they had started so far behind. It is very easy, I could, I could posit, to create explosive economic growth if one is building a textiles factories in Milan or uh, small business uh, auto parts engineering firms in northern Italy. If one is drawing on a huge amount of cheaper uh, uh, labour, one is drawing um, on a huge pool of what would have been a generation before peasant labour. It's very easy to cause an explosive economic growth if one is electrifying southern France, if, in, for instance, 
Britain had already, for instance, in that latter instance, had electrified under the Central Electricity Generating Board in the great planning triumph of the 1930s. So there's a distance between perception and reality. The perception is Europe is growing incredibly fast compared to Britain, and we need to do something about it. And we can see this in all kind of imagery. We've seen, we've seen a lot of images today. But Britain really, in this point, is the, is the kind of John Bull figure of the 19th century, the kind of, if you will, the Bullingdon Club diner on the left there in that picture, treated only to the kind of boiled beef and, and stale beer, while the other diners enjoy champagne, prosecco, and uh, the, <coughs> the, the good things of life. It's Daily Mail in 1960. This kind of imaginative figuring, I think, is very, very important, and uh, um, I'm writing about it at the moment, and under, underwritten, because it's not what historians usually get out of text-based archives, but it's, it's, I think, extremely important. That image goes in much faster than that text, and in fact, the evidence is that newspaper readers look at the image and probably not read all the text. Another example is from The Economist, and this is just um, examples of, this is just output and industrial production. And what we see in the line, what you might not be able to see in the world, the dull image, is of course the six are growing much, much faster, that red line, than the flat line of Britain. Again, if you're a businessman in 1963, spring 1963, you look at this image and it creates a tremendous sense of fear. A tremendous sense of fear that Britain is falling behind, expressed in popular books at the time like Michael Shank's Stagnant Society, Andrew Schoenfield's uh, popular uh, Modern Capitalism. One of the key points to remind you to draw your attention to here is the way in which the European Union was perceived from the start, and we've just been hearing about the European Union as a social democratic project, from the start as a social democratic project that might allow you to run your economy at a higher pressure of demand and run your economy faster. Why? Because you will have a social contract with the trade unions, with centrally organised trade unions, as in Italy, as in Germany, as in France, that will trade wage restraint on their part for higher welfare and more generous welfare states on the government's part, and the faster growth that will come from, from that will pay for those welfare states. So from the start, there's always the conception that this will allow a social democratic breakthrough to higher growth, as well as those bigger markets we've been looking at. Oh dear, that's not... Ah, good. I'll pop over that. Lastly, I think, and something we don't often uh, talk about in, this, in these uh, sessions, and something we don't talk about when we talk about business, when we imagine manufacturing, as in the FBI, is the view of the City of London. And this is Sigmund Warburg from his private papers in 1965. Now, Warburg was a extremely uh, pro-European and uh, was an uh, influential advisor of Wilson, uh, for instance, about European finance and about sterling. And Warburg essentially imagined London as the eurobond capital, issuing debt for Europe using contraband dollars, using dollars that London could get hold of. He imagined London as the banking centre of a new European Union, and he imagined London as the re uh, reseller and insurance capital of a reformed European Union which is exactly what it has become and which explains London's, helps explain London's explosive economic growth. And what this does, I think, I hope, is to broaden the frame slightly to look at business as a whole and to look at the way in which the European Union was increasingly imagined by business, from scepticism in the mid-50s to enthusiasm in the mid-70s. This is from the Midland Bank's journal. And in terms of iconography, moving right is often seen as kind of impression of progress, forwardness, speed in the kind of art history world. And if we look at the phraseology and we do some discourse analysis of how business sees the European Union, it is seen as go-ahead. It is seen as a cold wind of competition. It is seen as movement. It is seen as forwardness. It is seen, in short, as the future. And that's, I think, what transforms British business's uh, view. So to conclude, now I've reached 12 minutes... Um, to conclude, Europe was essentially seen as the go-ahead area, the go-ahead zone that we had to be in because their growth was faster, because they had a combination of open markets which forwarded capitalism and social democratic local agreements which helped to push the growth that allowed that capitalism to be democratically acceptable. If we look forward at our own referendum, I think the political science tells us that almost always status quos win in referenda, almost always. So how are we going to cast this referendum is going to be very, very important. If it becomes a referendum about holding on to the prosperity and the social agreements which we have, which 
they were pointing to as an inevitable future and therefore already part of the status quo between the 1950s and 70s, then stay will win. But if it becomes a, a referendum about mass immigration and all the kind of worries of, as we've heard, older voters about social, cultural, political change, and therefore it becomes staying is change, then leave may win. And it's going to be a struggle really informed by business. If the Labour Party faces a very, very, at least uncertain future, and possibly faces a future of electoral rout, and the Conservative Party is, on the other hand, not particularly popular, it's popular only by default against its enemies and its opponents, then it's going to be these institutions of civil society, of civic governance, that are going to have to play an enormous role because the political parties simply are not trusted. And hopefully, therefore, this kind of story about how business defines Europe and how, therefore, the public who work mostly in the private sector define Europe is going to become increasingly important. But I think I will, I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Neil. Glenn said how um, his university insists on Twitter feeds. Mine insists on using their PowerPoint template, so my apologies for that. Um, I want to sort of carry on from where Glenn sort of left off by looking at sort of what business was doing in the referendum and to sort of link that through to issues of what business may do uh, in the coming referendum. Um, Coming last, I was always a bit worried as to how much would be left for me to say. Thankfully, as I've only got 12 minutes to speak, it means I, do, I am able to skip over a few things fairly quickly in the slides. But I want to cover four things. So it's the attitudes, the broad attitudes of business, which I don't need to say very much about, but just to make it clear in 75 and then come back to it about today. Actors and the activities that business undertook in the 75 referendum, some of which you've heard about already. In terms of attitudes, it's very straightforward. All the surveys in 75 made it very clear at an extraordinary level of support for business, for, going, for staying in Europe. Times 415 out of 419. The Economist, 95%. CBI, none of its member trade associations and only a handful of individual companies. And if you look at business against staying in Europe, you literally have a few individual business people that come out openly to say that they are in favour of leaving the European Economic Community. The most famous is probably Sir John Hunter of Swan Hunter Shipbuilders, and he'd been against going into the community all the way through, so it wasn't as if it was anything sort of a change in his position. If you look at sort of organised groups, the only organised group that you can really find that, ha that t is a sort of business group as such is British Business for World Markets, and I love, I love the subtitle, Yorkshire Group. Uh, and literally, this is, this is only like two or three individuals when it comes to it that are publishing sort of organ, you know, saying that they're sort of representing a different view of business from um, the CBI and other actors uh, at the time. So the broad attitudes, it's very clear, extraordinary levels of support for staying in, as Glenn has already indicated. What were the actors? Who are the key actors? Well, obviously the CBI. As Glenn has said, the voice of industry, it was unquestioned in its authority at that time. There were other organised business groups, but the CBI really held sway in all sorts of different ways. The other key actors were large companies. And not just in terms of this sort of attitude about getting access to bigger markets, but it was that they were British companies, which is slightly different today that these were sort of seen as British companies, Br British, in many ways, successful companies. They may have had problems, you know, like Rolls-Royce and things like that. They may have had problems, but they're seen as broadly su successful companies or their success will have a huge impact on the economy and as such sort of, sort of viewed as sort of national champions. And those two bodies, the CBI and large companies, are the key actors in this 75 referendum. If you're looking for small and medium-sized enterprise, something I'll come back to in terms of today, there is very little voice there for them. There's a CBI 
has a smaller firms council, uh, which feeds its views up into the CBI machinery. But beyond that, there is no voice, there's certainly no separate voice for small and medium-sized enterprise at that time. So what does the CBI and companies do? CBI, it publishes things like Industry in Europe, uh, its statement of its views on European, into, uh, of staying in the community and explaining it. John Whitehorn, who's one of its senior officials, is the CBI's representative on Britain in Europe. Um, Arthur Knight uh, looks after the campaign as a sort of leading industrialist, uh, and it has a budget of 50,000 pounds. So it has these sort of open activities of, of advertising uh, the need to stay in, but its main activities, and Rob has talked about it slightly, was really behind the scenes. It wanted to supply information to companies, and it very explicitly, you know, these are the sorts of things, you can tell they're the 1970s from the colours that they, 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 they choose. It reminds me of my, my parents' sort of bright yellow Cortina that they bought in the 1970s. They're, ever, they're just sort of glaring, you have to put sunglasses on to read them. Their purpose was to supply information to companies through Mr. Europe, the Mr. Europe's that were the representatives in these companies, be it in terms of talking points, debating points, posters, all sorts of information and things of that sort. And specifically, the CBI said, yes, we need to have some profile, we need to make our views clear, but at the same time, it has to really come from the companies. It's the companies that must be putting the message across about staying in Europe, not us because of perceptions by workers and trade unions at the time that this would be seen as um, uh, political lobbying in a slightly different, in an explicit way, where it was slightly different coming from the companies. So what do companies do? Well, they do a variety of things. They're very closely involved in uh, Britain and Europe. They second experts to it. They have representatives on it. As Rob has said, you get company magazines with all sorts of articles. You have adverts, oops, sorry, um, with sort of text. Uh, this isn't a particularly great example, um, but it makes very clear the sort of arguments that business were making. It's not clear that you can read it, but what it says basically is to shareholders and workers, as well as to a general public, if you don't vote to stay in Europe, uh, to stay in Europe we will move our plants to the EEC, and you will lose your job. So if you want your job, vote to stay in. And some CEOs and chairmen of companies wrote exactly that to their employees, making it very clear what they felt. So there was a very clear message there. If you want to stay in, in your job, vote to stay in Europe. But mostly, the, the sort of fundamental element of what business was doing was funding. The main fundraising from Brit for Britain and Europe were business people. 363 companies donate more than 100 pounds. Only six individuals meet that level. 43 companies give over 10,000 pounds. Insurance companies together is 100,000 pounds. Banks, 200,000 pounds. They even give the CBI, who's wanted, had this campaign to raise 50,000 pounds. They didn't quite get there, so they gave the CBI 30,000 pounds. In contrast, the national referendum campaign only had seven donations over £100. We've, we've already talked about the level of difference in funding. Only one of those donations was from a company. The largest donation was from Transport and General Workers Union. So there's a huge financial difference in resources of the campaigns, as we've seen, as Rob was talking about. If we want to move that sort of historical context forward to today, what things are sort of different or stand out? Well, we don't have a single voice for industry. It's very clear. In terms of surveys of opinion, you've got Business for Britain survey, you've got Federation of Small Businesses, you've got CBI's Global Future document, you've got uh, British, Business, uh, sorry, Brit British Chambers of Commerce and the Institute of Directors have all carried out surveys of business opinion to try to frame the debate. What sorts of things do they say? Well, we've, we've already heard about sort of the, the recent attack on CBI survey. Um, and it's interesting that the Institute of Directors has actually come to the defense of the CBI and saying, well, actually, 
uh, there is a very large majority of business which is in favour of staying in the European Union and, you know, and endorsing the CBI's position in that sense. Generally, what those surveys tend to show is business broadly in favour, or the largest group are in favour, even in small businesses. The Federation of Small Businesses, 47% said stay in, 40% said they wanted to get out. And when they actually start to question why, red tape bureaucracy comes up as the big issue. But when they're actually asked for an example of what sort of red tape and bureaucracy that they're talking about, they often struggle to find it. So it's, it's a, a very sort of vague notion of red tape, but which, doesn't, which they have, but which they can't sort of really uh, articulate particularly clearly. So it's a much more fragmented, fragile position today about what business opinion is. But we need to be careful, I think, not to take that too far of saying that business is so divided that um, there is no sort of core, core attitude in that sense. I think you know, the most common attitude is to stay in, whether that's big business or small business. I've seen this one already. The reason I have this here is not it is partly to show how things have changed, and it's already been sort of mentioned in terms of uh, people's uh, perception of who are good people to have in a campaign. Back in 1975, we're talking about sports people as celebrities to endorse the campaign. Today, who do we get? We have Richard Branson as you know, uh, brought on to the Andrew Marr show in, with the launch of uh, Britain Stronger in Europe. We've already heard about Stuart Rose and Karen Brady being involved in that. So there's a change there in the role of business individuals and personalities, which certainly wasn't there in 1975. Business people were involved in the campaign but not in a particularly overt way, which is there today. So that you know, reflects a broader change in terms of perceptions of business people. In terms of activities, there's obviously, as I say, going to be more of a battle about speaking for who is speaking for business. In addition to that, I think you know, the funding is going to be more even, but it's still going to be dominated by the pro side. I don't think there's any doubt about that. UKIP, perhaps wanting to sort of play up the sort of David elements, you know, still says it's going to be David versus Goliath in that sense. But what I think is really interesting, what will be interesting to see in the next uh, period of time is actually what companies do to see how open and in their uh, approach to the referendum in expressing their views and the act, not just expressing their views, but the activities that they then carry out compared with 1975, where they were very explicit in what they did uh, in terms of persuading people. So other than giving money, what will they do other than either giving money or making statements to encourage people to vote in the way that they believe they want them to vote? And then finally, sort of three points that I'd sort of like to bring out. One has already been mentioned, the importance of context. I don't want to spend a lot of time going through that again, but in 1975, I think it is important. So John Whitehorn tells the CBI Council in April 1975 that the referendum isn't just about Europe, but, quote, whether the militants or the moderates won the battle. You know, that that's how he's trying to sell the whole idea of the referendum. It isn't just about Europe. It's about British society. The whole nature of the future of Britain rests on that vote. And that explains you know, in part, why British business at that time was so positive about staying in, that it is the context that matters. And that context, as we've heard, is different today. And that makes it more, more complex today. Equally, even then, European integration was and remains a very complex thing. Although it may be more complex now, it was still very complex for business then. It's not just about a single market. It's about the forms of regulation that are going to exist. Even 1975, the CBI were already concerned that regional policy, regional fund, wasn't developing as quickly as they hoped because they saw this as a, a good pot of money that they'd get. One CBI council member fully endorsed the commitment of the CBI to membership, to, to staying in, but at the same time voiced his concerns that, that about, about the community's bureaucracy and the cost to industry. So even then, there were these sort of issues were floating around in the background as to what was going to happen in the future, what were the implications. So it's not, in that sense, a straightforward issue. It's not a yes-no dichotomy for business. It's about where's the balance lie. 
And in relation to that, it is also about relativities. In the 1970s, British business wanted some sense of stability. So staying in Europe was one part of that stability. But it was also that it meant that British business felt it had been under attack from the 1960s onwards as you know, government intervention and, and all these sorts of policies and that it, it viewed Europe as a way of actually controlling that national government intervention and that being in Europe would give them another means of trying to reduce the intervention and interference which they felt they were experiencing at that time. Today, we have that very different perception about the EU as being, and I say perception, as the EU as being about red tape and bureaucracy. And so you start to see some business people talking about wheeling away from, moving away from that, winding it up uh, to get away from um, that sense of intervention and interference. Finally, I'm, I'm just about to stop. We haven't heard anything about betting. What do the bookmakers say? Back in 1975, you can see very dated. It's actually um, it's quite interesting. Spread betting here in 1975. What what the vote would be? Um, yes or no? Would be in general. Um, oops, sorry. Um, very different today in terms of this whole, whole technique of how professional gambling industries. What's what? The, what were the vote? Um, sorry. What did? The industry say at the time, 1975, very clearly they, they thought there was going to be a yes vote and very clearly they, they were right. 2015, they're still pretty sure there's going to be a yes vote. But um, while they're making their money, it's not quite so clear at the moment that it's so, such a strong level of certainty. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, Stephen, would you like to uh, get behind us? <laughs> okay, well, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me here. Um, I've heard Robert speak before, and um, listening to Glenn and Neil as well, I learned uh, quite a lot about the history of the, uh, history of the debate um, and businesses' involvement. I'm not going to try and give you a, a sort of history talk myself. Um, the experts have done that already. So um, what I'm going to do is talk about um, where the CBI is in the debate now, um, what our position is, and sort of how we, uh, how we arrived at that. Um, I think it's quite interesting that Britain held its first uh, referendum on Europe in the year that the CBI was celebrating its 10th birthday. Um, at today's CBI annual conference that's uh, continuing as we, uh, as we speak, um, which you've managed to drag me away from and which uh, Sue alluded to some of the fun that's been going on there uh, earlier today. Um, we're celebrating, uh, we're celebrating um, the organization's half century uh, this year at that, um, at that conference. Um, today the CBI is still the uh, largest business representative body in the UK. Um, we speak for around 190,000 businesses through our network of 140 trade associations. Um, large and medium-sized parent companies also tend to join the CBI directly, as do some smaller, um, fast-growing firms. And together, those businesses employ around 7 million people, which is roughly a third of Britain's private sector workforce. So that's the constituency that the CBI speaks for today. Our work on the, um, on the referendum that's coming up uh, by the end of 2017 um, began back in 2013, when the Prime Minister made his Bloomberg speech um, for the first time setting out that another referendum would be on the cards were he to be, uh, were he to be re elected, which uh, has obviously subsequently happened. Um, the CBI responded by undertaking what our outgoing Director General John Cridland, who has been with the organisation for over 30 years, uh, calls the biggest piece of work he can ever remember us doing in his time at the, uh, the organisation. We had a team from McKinsey working with us on the econo economic data, and we went through an extensive and rigorous member consultation exercise, which I'm happy to go into in more detail um, when, we, when we come to it, because some of that has been under question in the last week or so, as, uh, as we also heard from Sue. Um, look, the outcome of that was not a uniform view, um, 
and I think, um, you know, despite what we heard about some of the uh, some of the history, I think you know everyone in this room would be extremely surprised if there was a uniform view um, amongst such a large constituency as we would have been ourselves. Um, but it is true to say that a majority of our members want the UK to remain in a reformed EU. Um, and the survey and the survey that we did of, uh, of CBI members, um, one of the common misconceptions that has been in the media this week was that this was a survey of the entire business community. It was not. It was a survey of our own members. Um, and that said that uh, around eight out of ten CBI members um, want to remain in the, uh, in the EU. Um, most of our members felt that, on balance, the benefits of EU membership outweigh the disadvantages, but also that the EU is far from perfect and must reform to work better for business. So in terms of the benefits that members identified, um, they are firstly, and, uh, and the, biggest, the biggest benefit they identified, was being part of a single market of 500 million people, which gives, um, which gives UK businesses a lot more customers to sell directly to. Um, secondly, though, and very much linked to that, was the fact that uh, common EU rules make it much easier to do business across Europe. Um, and we actually found that small companies find this, particularly, find this particularly helpful, having one set of rules to trade with, uh, covering sort of Croatia to, to Portugal. Thirdly, um, the size of the single market helps to attract more international investment into the UK economy. So um, companies will invest in the UK using the UK as a gateway to sell into the rest of, into the rest of Europe through that single market. Fourthly, the role of the EU in helping businesses access the skills they need to grow. Free movement of people allows firms to plug skills gaps, although we understand that, um, we understand that this is publicly a contentious, uh, a contentious issue, and again, we, can talk, we might talk more about that in the, uh, in the discussion to come. Uh, lastly, the size of the single market helps open up third countries to trade. So um, we think that the UK, while giving up the right to sign trade deals by being a member of the EU, gets more and better quality trade deals by uh, having the weight of the single market behind us when we're negotiating those trade deals. And we, uh, and we think the facts very much back that up. And we've published on our website today a little um, fact sheet about, um, about, why that, about why that is the case. But as I just said before, the EU isn't perfect. And our members identified a lot of areas, areas for improvement. And we very much support the Prime Minister's effort to achieve reform. The businesses we speak for want the EU to do a lot more to fulfill its economic potential. Some of the main areas we're pushing for reform on are firstly, um, and we've heard a bit about this was uh, an issue in the, back in the 70s as well, um, reducing and simplifying EU rules. So EU rules can be powerful to open up markets, but often the EU sort of goes too far and goes into areas where it doesn't add value. <coughs> Secondly, breaking down barriers to EU trade in services. Um, trade in uh, the single market works very well for goods, but it doesn't work nearly as well for services. And given that the uh, UK is a very heavily service-dependent economy, um, we actually have quite a lot to gain from, uh, from that area. Thirdly, and similarly, it's about creating a digital single market in the EU to um, boost trade online. And this would be very beneficial for, um, for, both, uh, for both businesses and consumers alike. And fourthly, I mentioned that uh, EU trade deals can be, uh, can be very powerful. Um, well, we need the EU to sign more trade deals, and in particular, we're looking for the EU to conclude negotiations that currently has underway with, uh, with the US and Japan. Um, incidentally, if the EU were to, uh, to conclude all the trade deals it currently has under negotiation, 88% of, uh, of the UK's trade would then be covered by a preferential um, EU, trade, EU trade, trade deal, um, which we think is a, very, uh, is a very powerful reason for why, um, for why uh, EU trade deals can benefit the UK economy. The other thing that we're also acutely aware of um, is the need to safeguard the UK's place in the single market as the Eurozone integrates post-crisis. Uh, post this is what the Chancellor was speaking about in Germany last week, and we agree with him that um, there need to be some explicit safeguards to set the uh, UK's EU membership on a sure footing for the years to come. In terms of action, then, what are the CBI actually doing? Um, well, unlike some other groups who often talk quite a good game on EU reform, we've actually been out there trying to make reform, uh, trying to make reform happen. So, for example, we've been working with our network of sister federations across Europe to build a business consensus for reform. I mean, what business group in Euro in, across Europe doesn't want a more competitive EU? And we've also, um, we've also been using our Brussels office to lead the fight for reform on the ground in Brussels itself. So we've actually been out there on the ground um, trying to make reform happen. And I think we're starting to see some signs of progress on reform. So uh, as an example, back in 2010, the EU, um, the EU was going to bring in, it said, about 300 new initiatives. 
the figure for uh, 2015 and 2016 is 23. Um, so clearly there's quite a long way still to go on reform, but that is, a, that is quite a marked step change and we're beginning to see some signs of progress. Um, as you've seen from our annual conference today and the speeches from our Director General and our, uh, and our President, the CBI will continue to represent the current view of the majority of our members that they want to remain in a reformed EU. Um, and also, as our President said, when we see the reforms that the Prime Minister, ach the, the Prime Minister achieves, um, we'll go back and ask our members again for their view on the basis of that deal and what that means for the, um, for the CBI's role in the sort of, uh, I guess, when it comes to kind of the uh, campaign proper, um, if you like. Although it kind of feels like things are already starting to heat up pretty quickly. Thank you. Alex, so, thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much. My name is Alex Storey. I'm, um, uh, I currently work for a company called WealthX. We are in uh, wealth intelligence. We are based in Singapore. Uh, we uh, grew from having five people in 2010. We now employ 240. Most of them work outside of the EU. The reason why I say this is because we started with one contract in 2010. We now have revenues of about 40 million and we're hoping to grow quite fast. This is an important point. I develop business in Germany. I develop business in uh, Austria. I've been to China. I speak to a lot of businessmen around the world and they do not understand the EU. The EU for them is a conundrum. It makes absolutely no sense. Let me give you an example. I was in the Fujian province uh, having a look at the free trade zone that the Chinese government is setting up for its um, uh, Silk Road development. In Fujian province, a province of 30, 37 million people, Fuzhou is the capital. What do they have a free trade zone? What do they want to have from their trade? Who do they trade with? Well, they trade with France. They trade with Spain. They trade with the Middle East, some of the countries there. They know exactly what their markets are. They do not trade with the EU. And why is that? Because the EU is not Europe. We've seen for the entire presentations that we're talking about Europe. Britain is in Europe and will always be in Europe. It will never sever itself off from the continent. It's complete madness to even suggest that. But tell me why, as a businessman, I need to be able to comply to EU laws if I want to sell sweets to France and subsidize the farming of the French. That makes no sense at all. There is nothing in the EU that really makes any sense. And what's interesting about this debate, and it's what's interesting about Business for Britain as well, is that we know that business is split. Why is it split? I think it's more like 40-40 for my last uh, poll last uh, uh, three or four weeks ago. Why is it split? Because the key question, the key question in this debate is really about who makes the laws for whom. That's what it is. It's not about Benefits here, benefits in the detail, looking at the tree. No, it's taking a step back and looking at the whole wood and being able to control people who make regulation. In Britain, we always lose. We, want, we make proposals in the European Council and we get turned down. There's no hope for us to be able to reform it. It's all very well for people from the CBI and others to say, ah, oh, what we need is to cut a little bit of red tape here and it's all right, it's going to be fine. It won't be because we're not in charge. Now, who, who has a business here likes the idea of his competitor making decisions for him? No one. It's an absurd statement to say that the EU is good for trade. We know what the facts are. I'll give you a demonstration of what it is. What does Juncker say about the EU? The EU is for jobs, growth, and competitiveness. That's what the aim is. The strategy in his mind to get to that goal is ever closer union, but we know that ever closer union doesn't fit. It doesn't fit the panoply that we have, we, it, the, the, the texture of what Europe actually is. It doesn't. So what does it do? It overregulates, and it can't reform because every regulation that comes in is a step closer to his goal of ever closer union. But ever closer union is a bit like the war on terror or the war on drugs. There's no end point. You never know when you achieved it. So you keep regulating it. Now, on the jobs growth in competitiveness front, where are we? Where are we in the EU? Can you tell me, can anybody here in this room tell me that the EU is doing well? 
I love Europe. I'm half English, half Austrian. I, grew, I was born in France. My wife is German. I have Italian and Spanish family. I love Europe. I'm a patriot for Europe. But I see the EU humiliating Europe all the time. I see the Greeks being humiliated. I've seen the Italians have the democracy robbed from them. And there we have it. We have people making small talk, repeating nonsense all the time. We know that the same people were backing Euro in the, two, in the 1990s. I know because I was at university thinking, guys, what are you doing? The Euro can never work. It can never work. It's madness. It's the European Unemployment and Recession Organization. That's what the Euro is. And yet, the entire business community from the CBI and others went, we need to go. We will lose 3 million jobs if we don't join. Come on, let's wake up. What happened before that? Ten years before, we had the ERM. What happened? Why my best friend, Bobby Thatcher's dad, went bankrupt. Why? Because we put foreign affairs above domestic affairs. We said that what we wanted is to keep the pound linked to the Deutschmark in order to have no inflation. It's madness. It makes no economic sense. And now we know it. The same people are telling you exactly the same things in the same way. And they're trying to get you to vote in the same way. We have to look at the facts. The facts are this. The EU is bad for Europe. And if we want a Europe to succeed, we need to have an organization that reflects the diversity of Europe, the differences. That's when it will succeed. As a businessman, I know that I trade on the differences. And so do you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, particularly that passion at the end from, from both of you. Uh, now, we haven't got that long for questions. Uh, if people would like to put their hands up, and we'll try and do two or three at a time. Uh, yes, um, a lady there. Is it Cordelia? Lindsay. Lindsay, sorry. And next we'll come, and, and we'll take, I'll take your question too. Um, I, I'm interested in how... Um, how successful or to what extent businesses and business organizations were able to have their views heard by um, various governments in the 1960s and the 1970s? Kind of were, what strategies did business organizations use um, to have their views heard? And do you think that those strategies were successful? Right, and over there, yes, gentlemen there. Uh, Professor O'Hara mentioned um, Warburg and his arguments and the people who listened to him, was anybody listening to the, main, to the Hungarian-born economists who were making the case for no, um, from the 60s onwards, um, um, Bartok and uh, Urban? Mm -hmm. Okay, two questions. First of all, um, how um, far was uh, successful was business in, um, how did they make their, their views heard? And was anybody listening to the no case from uh, other people, other countries? Uh, Glenn, would you like oh, to start? Yes, here, here. Okay, um, the, f the first about influence is there were lots of opportunities. There were probably more opportunities than there are now because uh, the British state was in, uh, entangled for good or ill in all sorts of organisations, all sorts of structures. For instance, the National Economic Development Council, where you would meet ministers more. So the Board of Trade, for instance, is meeting business probably more than biz does now in terms of uh, agreeing regional, regional aid, agreeing production development, agreeing uh, import and export development with the Commonwealth. So actually you meet ministers more in this period, and it's extremely influential. Um, in terms of Hungarian economists, just so essentially Nikki Kaldor or Thomas Balog, oh, yeah, yeah, but Kaldor. Essentially, Warburg is a, the reason I picked Warburg is Warburg's extremely influential on Harold Wilson, and we heard a lot about Wilson earlier. Warburg's essentially the, the kind of demon on the other ear, uh, on the other shoulder to the two Hungarians, and Warburg's always saying, and he meets uh, Wilson a lot, especially in 64, 65, saying, if you go down the road of uh, a siege economy, if you go down the road of a more developmental capitalism, a sort of recently uh, vogue phrase, you will mean that what it will mean is the city of London will become terminally uncompetitive and New York and Frankfurt and Paris will take over all these businesses. And one of the reasons that, one of the reasons, I mean, Helen knows more about this than I do, Helen Parr is here. One of the reasons that Wilson moves towards commitment is, is, is this kind of view that the bond market, the insurance market, the banking market, the secondary insurance market, it must stay in London. 
And I think Wahlberg wins out um, for lots of reasons, partly because he's so helpful in terms of, of defending Sterling in 64 to 67. And he's the most influential um, in detail in terms of Callahan and Wilson's attempt to defend the currency. Neil? OK, um, first question. Uh, by my book. <laughs> um, Always a good answer. <laughs> I think you know, it varies. It changes over time. By and large, they get uh, very well heard, either as an institution through the CBI or as individual business people um, dealing with Harold Macmillan and stuff like that. There are times where it becomes more difficult um, when EFTA's in, in existence before the first application is a problem. Um, but generally, yes, they are. They have a ready access. Uh, on the second one, um, what would I say about them? I'd say whenever I've come across them, it's been nothing to do with Europe. That, so their engagement has been on economic policy with the Treasury, um, not on Europe in that sense, and where they are one of many voices influential voices but one of many voices and so they're part of a debate um, but not <coughs> always um, successful. It's confused that debate as well because Kellogg, Calder and Balog advocate in different ways um, devaluing, devaluing sterling early on and that would be a pro-European uh, argument in many ways but yet they are very sceptical about the ability of Britain's industries to compete without large-scale industrial restructuring led by the government, which would take a while before you could enter. So that the, the argument is by no means clear, which I kind of knew what Neil argues in his book, which is different businesses and different art experts argue very complex structures that make the argument not dichotomous. Um, I think some of the historical stuff we've heard has been really, really fascinating, but I wonder if I could ask Stephen and Alex a slightly different uh, question, which is... Um, the conference is called Lessons from History. How far can we learn from what happened in 1975, particularly given that today um, both your camps ha have a certain degree of disunity? And the other thing is that there seems to be absolutely no agreement on what the facts and figures are. You're both very authoritative in coming out with them, but people really aren't going to know what to make of it. Stephen. Um, yeah, I mean, look, it's, um, it's quite clear that we're in very different times today to, um, to the 70s. Um, and I think, for a start, um, one, of the, uh, one of the key differences is we're in quite different economic times, actually. Now the UK is doing relatively well, and the rest of Europe is doing sort of relative, relatively worse. I think that gives quite a different, um, quite a different backdrop to the, um, quite a different backdrop to the discussion. Um, I also think that the kind of public perception um, of, um, of sort of any, uh, uh, of any sort of uh, elite seem to, be, seem to be sort of um, speaking out or, uh, or commenting on the issue is taken with um, more of a pinch of salt now than it was, uh, than it was, uh, than it was back then, um, although I'm sure historians will correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> um, and, uh, and also there's, uh, there's also quite sort of different, uh, different legal frameworks around, around, around things as well. Um, so I think, that, I, think there are, I think there are quite a lot of differences. Um, I think also um, one, one of the other things that, uh, that happens today is that sort of um, there's a bit more of a, um, there's probably a bit more of a kind of um, media propensity to make sure um, different sides of the, of the argument are, complete, are completely balanced. So sort of you know, one person's figure, no matter how sort of rigorously or, uh, or sort of well uh, or well researched um, it happens to be, will be put up against someone that will be put up against other figures, um, whether, whether they're well researched or plucked out of thin air, um, and they'll be put, put one up against the other, um, and people will say, oh, well, we, we, can't, we don't know who to believe because you've got one figure on one side and one figure on the other side. A plague on all your houses, they might say. <laughs> Alex, what's your view? Well, Change or Go is um, a small pamphlet. <laughs> <laughs> Business for Britain uh, released a few months. A hundred pages of which are copied and pasted from uh, other. Yeah, but um, have you seen how many work. pages they are? I mean, it's just I've read it all. all. <laughs> <laughs> so Probably one of the Two percent of the pages have been cut and pasted. There you go. So don't believe a word of it. <laughs> no. So, um, so what is it that we're here for? I mean, when we're in business, what do we want in business? Business is really about making cash. We, I want when I'm 
when I work, I want to be able to, when I, when I set up an idea, I want it to be profitable. I know that some people find that ludicrous, but really that's the reason why somebody is going to lend me his capital. I invest it, he invests it in me or in a venture. Does it work, does it not? I can show you Apple. Apple has an iPhone. Uh, we now have a trade deal with America, and yet most of you here have an iPhone. You don't really think about whether there is a trade deal on the other side. What you're going to do is you're going to buy the product because you like the product. That's really what it is. And a business is successful if what they do is something that you like and is something that you want to pay for. I mean, I just want to but, say that. That's... But can the no uh, camp uh, learn anything from history? Can you learn uh, well, anything I mean, from the past? Well, yes. Yeah, so so uh, that's the reason why Business for Britain is around. The reason, uh, is the reason uh, we have set up Business for Britain is because we want to be skeptical. And I think most of you in this room understand that skepticism is a sign of intelligence. If you're not skeptical, you won't believe all sorts of things. And in business, you might be, you, you might be taken for a ride. You have, to, you have to be skeptical about something that somebody is trying to sell you. And so what, what did we do? What's our lesson from history? We learned that during the ERM crash uh, or crisis of 1992, during the Euro campaigns, we found the CBI and all sorts of business pressure groups we're completely misrepresenting the facts and we're pushing for something that was an experiment on the peoples of this country. And they were quite happy to experiment with them without really thinking about what the, cons the consequences would be. W what do we know now? We know that Peter Mandelson, the biggest supporter of the euro, finally came to the conclusion that the euro would have been a bad thing. I can tell you something. Uh, it, had we had the euro in this country, it would have been devastating we would have had a massive, massive crash. Very, very quickly, because we've only got a few minutes. And would we put it up for your... Yeah, I think problem, we've only got a few minutes. So could a uh, lady over there? Okay. Well, I've sat in the European Parliament for 17 yeah. I've sat in the uh, European Parliament. Can you ask Parliament. your question very briefly, yeah, please? For 17 months. I haven't seen any reform. Um, Actually, another question for you. I don't know who your speakers were at the CBI today, but last year I tried to get a platform for Nigel Farage and you turned him down. I also offered to pay £5,000 yeah. to have um, an exhibition stand there. You turned me down because you said that there was can no we have, exhibition sorry, space. Sorry, can we have the question, And then please? when I actually said, I'm a business and I, I got somebody else to ring up, you said, yes, it's £5,000. Why are you not engaging with the Eurosceptics? I have a question. Yes, over there. Yeah, so um, there's, a, there's a divide, as far as I can see, in the Eurosceptic camp, yeah. which, well, there's, there's definitely a divide. There's a divide in the Eurosceptic camp between this sort of kind of like blue collar can kind of... Can you be quick? I'm sorry yeah, to yeah, hurry yeah, you, will, but it will we be quick have to there's, clear the There seems to be a very blue collar populist appeal that UKIP has, right, which clearly takes away traditional Labour voters. I'm not convinced that business for Britain, that the, the kind of business space of a campaign is what is appealing to a kind of like increasingly populist politics, um, to business for Britain and possibly to the CBI as well, when we have this kind of like populist anti-establishment politics is a kind of suited uh, white collar kind of appeal on both sides, um, the thing that is going to draw maximum support to either side. Okay, Stephen, very briefly, um, or well, all of you briefly. Yeah, so very briefly, just to address the, um, the, um, uh, the lady's point, um, uh, my boss had a meeting with uh, Nigel Farage two weeks ago, so we are engaging. On the, um, on the, on the point just then, I think, I think you're completely right. I think it just needs a diversity of voices from across the spectrum, and the more voices that we have and the more debate that we have on this issue, that, that can only be the better. Alex, more diversity of voices? Very well, briefly, I, mean, I think there are quite a few diverse voices here. I, mean, yeah. I think we can't do much better than that. I mean, it's a binary question. It's either you want to leave or you want to remain. <coughs> and there'll be lots and lots of reasons why somebody wants to remain and why somebody wants to leave. I think what's really exciting is that we're having the debate. And for that, having worked at Bloomberg, when the speech was held in the fight for the fixed income department, I'm very happy. Neil. Um, I think we can learn from history. <laughs> um, and I think it... it it's clearly a case of um, looking for lessons but with scepticism um, in the sense of what is applicable and what isn't. And one thing I would say about the CBI in all its surveys that it did about European integration that I've been able to see, not recent ones, but certainly through to the 80s in terms of what's available to historians, is... Um, 
that it is quite balanced in, in the way that it deals with alternative opinion. So even in the 75 referendum, although it only says there's no trade, u trade associations who are against it or, and only a handful, it then spends a page setting out what those views were that were set out. So it, it does give a voice. It's not simply presenting one voice. It is willing to sort of, in that sense, open itself up. In terms of the lessons of history and uh, new voices, I think that the lesson of history I'll take would be the role of the Prime Minister, which is enormously important. And Wilson really as a kind of uh, national uncle figure in 74, 75, 76, is vastly important in carrying that through. And David Cameron's numbers uh, are quite good for a national leader in these populist periods, and he's been a prime minister for five years. He's been successively underestimated by people. If he chooses to lead a stay-in campaign, that will be enormously important and the most important factor in the campaign. Can I just add a quick point? Well... Very quick. <laughs> Super quick. What's interesting compared to 1975 is that no political party is really backing the EU fully. Okay, okay. I think that's, that sounds to me like a can of worms question. No, it's not. <laughs> if you start saying who's actually going to back what, what I'm sorry well, to neutral, hurry you on. The Conservative Party is neutral, right? The Conservative well, okay. Party is... It takes no stance on us. Well, okay. but, it, but in the country, the Conservative Party is its leader. Yeah. And he seems to be in favour of staying in, but we'll find out tomorrow when he makes this big speech, I think. Uh, sorry to hurry you up, but uh, we're going to clear the room and um, there'll be a break just for about five minutes. And then um, we'll be coming back to hear uh, David Liddington. Uh, thank you all for coming and thank you all very much to our speakers and our <laughs>